Keep going, yes. Also, so, so do you want to do the Ms. Lansing for the guy? So would you like to uh, do a brief introduction on your background? Um, so if we're going in this order, I might swap them all around just yeah. because we have to sit in order. Okay. Okay. We don't have to sit in order. We're going to introduce them in like boom, boom, boom. You, know, you, you introduce before you try and speak, right? Yeah, so what we're going to do is do an introduction that each person, like, intro, speak, intro, speak, intro, yeah. speak. Yeah, because people forget that they get to that. Yeah. Also joining us is Dr. Hong, the Executive Director and Senior Fellow at the Institute for China America Studies based in Washington, D.C. She holds a PhD in Interdisciplinary Studies of International Law and International Relations from the University of Alberta, Canada. She is currently a Research Fellow with the China Institute. University of Alberta, Canada, and the National Institute for South China Sea Studies. Her research takes an interdisciplinary approach to examining international relations and international law, with a focus on international relations and comparative politics in general, ocean governance in East Asia and the Arctic, law of the sea, international security, particularly non-traditional security, and international dispute settlement and conflict resolution. Dr. Hong, thank you for joining us today. If you would like to take a minute to introduce your research so and further speak about your interests. And so they know that each has about five minutes. I told them before, yeah. Okay. Our third speaker is Dr. Weitz, a professor of the practice and a director of maritime study. I'm going to ask him. I don't think he's here yet. Oh, okay. He's very excited. Weitz? Okay. Uh, a professor of the practice and director of the maritime studies program at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. Are you cool with the Fletcher thing being there? Heck, we're good. Check. We're good. Okay. Um, I'm going to say, for each of them, I'm going to say, if you'd like to take a moment to introduce your research, mm -hmm. um, this is what I'm working on right now, so we'll probably ask about this project, yeah. if you want to talk about that more. Um, right, right, right. Yeah. Paul, all I have is our research, not a good exchange right here. I just want to use the bathroom. Um, and you have to go on food at once. What? Um, cut out of Awesome. Awesome, 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 awesome. Um, you have his phone number or anything? No, he never got back to me. He never got back to me. Yeah, I should have sent it. So how do I check? No, it's okay. I'll bring it all, but... And is where I deemed it to be good. But if they're really loud... Oh, there's a little bit of it. Um... And... Okay. So, um... Maybe it's just because it's shit, so like... So it's I just, uh, 
Oh, I just yeah. called you. Oh, good. Hi. I'm here. Don't worry. Yeah. My uh, babysitter arrived a little late. So oh, no worries. <laughs> Thank you. I was way more stressed than you were, trust me. Oh. Yeah, so, uh, um, all right, good. Everybody good? Uh -huh. I mean, yeah, it's nice to meet you. Yeah, all right, yeah. terrific. Hi, I'm Mariana. All right, nice, nice to, meet to meet you. you. Yeah, sorry, I was AWOL. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a busy fall. Yeah. So. How'd it go so far? It's so good. Yeah. 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 Super. Our team got here like very late, so we're just gonna get start a little bit late to give our um panel. Fletcher, we call that Fletcher fashionably late. So I am all for that. I'm all for that. Yeah. Okay. Super. I'm gonna go. So I've met. I just saw Body Soul. Body Yeah. Who are our other? um Doctor Nong. Okay. Yeah. Surprisingly generous. Really? They should be. They know you are. Yeah. So, actually. Hello, 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 hello. Okay. I said over here. Yeah, I think so. 
there. Right only take up. You're there, I'm there. That's the problem. I always go on Sunday. Um, so 
Hello, good morning, everybody. Can I your attention, please? Okay, I think we'll be starting soon. Good morning, everybody. Um, hope you're enjoying breakfast. Uh, my name is Mika Mizuguchi, and I'm the programming director of Allies. And I'm Jackson Lubke, I'm one of the co-directors of Allies. And we will both be your moderators for this panel. Uh, this panel will be focusing on the strategic importance of the Arctic and how, with climate change, the increasing accessibility to natural resources is attracting global superpowers near and far. Um, oil, gas, coal, rare earth metals, and fisheries are spread all across the Arctic, and there is a considerable capacity for economic expansion in the region. And so access to strategic points, trade routes, and other claims have expanded into a more overt competition, as we see notably with the US, China, and Russia. Um, and as the emerging frontier rich in natural resources, um, our, the Arctic will be an area of extreme importance for the world's key actors. Our speakers this morning will be Ms. Marisol Maddox, Dr. Nong Hong, and Dr. Rockford Weitz. I'll give a brief bio and they can introduce themselves. Um, so you hear it from them instead of me. Um, our first speaker is Ms. Maddox, a senior Arctic analyst at the Polar Institute of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, DC. Her research considers the nexus of the Arctic, climate change, security, and geopolitics. She is particularly interested in how the growing presence of actorless threats, such as climate change and biodiversity loss, challenges strategic thinking um, and first order assumptions about security. Ms. Maddox is also a non-resident research fellow at the Center for Climate and Security, a term member on the Council of Foreign Relations, and a member of the Newport 
Arctic Scholars Initiative at the U.S. Naval War College. If you'd like to give a brief introduction to your work. Great, thank you so much. Um, thanks for putting this together. Um, so my name is Marisol Maddox. Um, I focus on, on the Arctic at the Polar Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center in DC. And basically the reason that I came to studying the Arctic is because it is warming faster than anywhere in the world. Uh, it's warming four times faster than the global average. And the impacts for the rest of the world of Arctic change are profound to say the least. And so this is a place that uh, is, you know, the changes, the rate of change that we're seeing um, is really important to be understanding in terms of our global climate policy and an understanding uh, that, you know, that intersection between climate change and security issues. There are some, you know, current issues around, uh, you know, the, the time frames that we are working with in, in the climate policy world and uh, the carbon budget that we think that we have to work with because things like permafrost, which is uh, permanently frozen ground uh, in, in the Arctic, so it's about 60% of Russia, which is 11 time zones big, so a massive country, about 80% of Alaska, about 40% of Canada is underlaid by permafrost, but the emissions uh, associated with, with Arctic thaw, which is largely um, coming from methane, which is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, is largely absent from our current climate models. And so, and it's also absent from then the carbon budgets because it's really hard to uh, be able to quantify and characterize permafrost because it's not just like one layer that exists, uh, you know, in a homogenous way. It's it's very variable, and, and there's a lot of um, you know different ways that it can form. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen the the methane craters that have opened in Russia, but there's some places where it's hundreds of feet deep. And we're going back millions and millions and millions of years in time. And so uh, as the permafrost is thawing, you have uh, not only the, the uh, increased greenhouse gases entering the atmosphere, but there's also a lot of concern about the millions of years of viruses and bacteria and fungi that are then being exposed to the air, to, uh, to groundwater. And so being able to have more, um, you know, an appreciation for some of the biosecurity risks associated with Arctic change are really important. And especially with how disruptive COVID has been, uh, I think, you know, there's more interest in, in realizing um, it, it's not just about what is there, but also how it's treated in the lab, right? So there's a lot of um, is issues around that. Um, and so, so we, yeah, like I said, we have these, these significant gaps currently. Um, the other really important realization that's been happening that policy has to catch up with is that we are going to be seeing uh, more greater levels of disruption at lower levels of warming than we had anticipated when the Paris Agreement was negotiated. So the Paris Agreement, the objective is to not allow global warming to exceed two degrees, and ideally we would cap it to 1.5 degrees, but we're already seeing changes now at 1.1 degrees of warming that weren't projected until like 2070. And so this like Greenland ice sheet melt, for instance, and Greenland that's about 21 feet of global sea level that's locked up just in that one ice sheet. And in 2019, the, the melting that we saw during this July heat wave that level of melt hadn't been projected to happen until 2070. So things like that are showing us that uh, we really need to be understanding uh, the the climate the climate threat. Um, and what's interesting about it, and this is where it kind of ties in that actualist threats um, part of my bio is that this threat is really different from the typical adversary that we think about because it's not, uh, you know, you can't use diplomacy, right, with climate change. You can't try to 
like reason with climate change to be like, well, maybe just don't warm so much. Like ultimately, this is about human behavior. And so the good thing about that is that we can do a lot, right? And we have unprecedented levels of strategic foresight with understanding that the climate change impacts and, and impacts on biodiversity loss and all of these different things, it's really, you, you have to think in terms of systems to understand the potential for disruption. Um, but th there's also a lot that we can be doing, um, and these are really tremendous opportunities for really like radical levels of cooperation at the international, national, and subnational levels. Um, and that cooperation really is is required in order to get this right. So I think that I'm uh, I like to be very eyes wide open on how bad things are because I think that then. Uh, first of all, we need to know what we're up against. And ultimately, the question is, do we want to be as well positioned as possible to deal with with reality? And I would say yes. And so I, I, I take it more as a challenge. Like, we can do this. But it's about understanding how serious it is and really, you know, having a high level of integrity with moving forward and trying to advance progress on these issues. Um, so I'll, I'll stop it there and hand it over to here. Thank you so much for those remarks. It's very interesting. Um, we'll move on to Dr. Hong. Dr. Hong is the Executive Director and Senior Fellow at the Institute for China America Studies based in Washington, D.C. She holds a PhD in Interdisciplinary Studies of International Law and International Relations from the University of Alberta, Canada. She is currently a research fellow with the China Institute, University of Alberta, Canada, and the National Institute for South China Sea Studies. Her research takes an interdisciplinary approach to examining international relations and international law, with a focus on international relations and comparative politics in general, ocean governance in East Asia and the Arctic, law of the sea, international security, particularly non-traditional security, and international dispute settlement and conflict resolution. resolution sorry. If you'd like to take a moment to introduce yourself and your background. Thank you, Jason. Uh, there's a lot to, to say why I uh, my research focus like switch from not switch like move from the South China Sea to the Arctic. I spent many years working on the legal issues in the South China Sea and also looking at the different approach of dispute settlement and the state practices in the South China Sea. And then I started to look at the Arctic issues simply because when I look at because my interest focus on China-U.S. relations and I'm trying to understand also from my academic perspective, trying to provide a balanced view on what is China's policy on the Arctic and what is interest. So I try to look at China's Arctic uh, looking through from the legal issue, political issues, environmental issues, economic issues. So there are a couple of, uh, I think I start observing China's long-term uh, effort to be a part of the ocean governance Arctic back from 2006 when China, as the first time I explained very clearly, it wanted to be a uh, observer status in the Arctic. And then it took China many years, and very hard, because it has encountered a lot of difficulty from the Arctic five states, like Russia, from Canada, from US, Although it also in, uh, well, uh, have been welcomed by some of the Nordic European session Nordic countries, so it has been uh, China actually used to uh, spend seven years uh, until 2013. There was uh, granted observer status with the other four uh, Asian countries, and then another uh, another five years because after 2013, Japan, South Korea has stood up very quickly to issue the other policy. But for China, it has actually uh, two five years. There there's a reason for that because uh, China has been playing quite a low profile in pursuing its interest in Arctic from 2013 to 2018 and has also been a very careful uh, learning process how to articulate interest in Arctic using a language more uh, well received by the Western uh, community and also uh, less suspicious by the Arctic communities. And then 20, from 2018 to 20. 20 this year, I think it's a long process that China has engaged in many areas in, in, the, in the Arctic through uh, building bilateral relations with the Arctic state, not only the Arctic 
Beatles but also with uh, the other polar states and also spend an uh, investment on trade uh, on trade issues and also on the poor facility structure and certainly be involving many of the international institutions and legal international legal framework has been a lot of time on these issues however I think there is um, the reason my current approach trying to understand on the one hand to uh, articulate Chinese interest in Arctic, but also want to help to understand what what is the U.S. and China's engagement in Arctic. Because, for example, if I compare the South China Sea with the Arctic, the two countries had they're playing different role. For the South China, China is a coastal state. The U.S. is strategic holders a very important uh, user of the uh, South China Sea. But switching back to the art is opposite. So US is a coastal state. It has its obligation. It has also its responsibility and rights. For China, it's not an artist state. Um, although in China's 2018 anti policy white paper, there's two terms that actually gain a lot of attention and debate. One is China calls itself as a near artist state, and the other phrase is the stakeholders. I personally think the stakeholder is a more appropriate phrase to uh, understand China's interest and policy in the Arctic. When China says near artist state, it's implied ge geographical implication, not political, not geopolitical implication. I think it's the uh, stakeholder. I think on the one hand, for China, it's very clear it's not other states. And in order to gain the observer state of Arctic Council, and you have to recognize the sovereignty claim of the other states, and you have also recognized the sovereign rights of those other states. China has a very clear vision. It's not an other state, so it's going to respect international and also respect all the domestic legislation of those country, little countries uh, in areas such as shipping, such as uh, resource development, and also protection of indigenous people's uh, way. I have a lot to say, but I think I'm going to give <laughs> to the next one. And I'm happy to talk about China's, uh, why people are concerning about the US China. Russian-China relations in the Arctic. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, next up is Dr. Weitz. Dr. Weitz is a professor of the practice and director of Maritime Studies program at the Fletcher School at Tufts University, right over there. Um, he teaches courses in yeah. <laughs> um, he teaches courses in global maritime affairs and maritime security. His Tisch Faculty Fellow Project, Engaging Arctic Indigenous Stakeholders, focused on preparing an executive an executive education curriculum for a possible Fletcher School leadership program that would target Arctic indigenous youth interested in learning about Arctic geopolitics, climate policy, sustainable development, and diplomacy. This project helps further build cross-school collaboration across the university. And <laughs> on exploring more ways how the Fletcher School and other parts of Tessie universities can support the next generation of young climate leaders. I'll let Dr. White introduce himself further and I'm sure explain why is the globe. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, I always bring a globe here. Yeah, so uh, so uh, good morning and welcome to the Fletcher School. I actually teach my two classes in this room. So uh, my office is just up one floor. So um, uh, first of all, welcome to the Fletcher School. So we're a school of, uh, of international relations at Tufts. Um, we're actually the oldest graduate only international affairs school. Um, I'm going to do a little survey of the audience first, then I'll introduce myself. Uh, so how many of you are from the, the U.S.? Okay. All right. How many from Canada? Okay. Any of the Nordic countries? Okay. Russia? All right. Near Arctic countries? Okay. Uh, Greece? That's a near Arctic country. All right. So yeah. All right. Welcome. All right. So, uh, okay. Um, so, uh, so I'm director of maritime studies here, um, and uh, the Fletcher Maritime Studies program is the smallest, but I usually argue the most agile research center at the Fletcher School. Um, we're also the poorest, unfortunately, but that's that's okay. Um, uh, so, uh, so I'm from, um, so I'm a civilian, uh, but I but I focus on the oceans here. Uh, my main job is to combat sea blindness. So that um, kind of not appreciating how important the oceans are for security or for climate. And because the Arctic is an ocean, it falls under my jurisdiction here. Um, I'm from uh, the near Arctic US state of Idaho, uh, which is a landlocked state. Um, and uh, uh, my claim to Arctic fame is that I, I did a um, consulting project for uh, the Prime Minister's Office of Singapore in 2006. I was a PhD student here at the time. And, uh, and we 
they they hired my consultancy to look at what would be the global implications of an opening Arctic for Singapore's port, which at the time was the world's largest. Now Shanghai is the largest. It's maritime sector, and it's got a big one, um, and it's wider economy. Now I brought the globe because uh, I, I I always bring it because uh, our uh, so our tagline used to be uh, per, we prepare leaders with a global perspective, um, and uh, and I actually think a global perspective is quite lacking. So uh, for example, most people don't realize that say New Zealand is uh, is further from Vietnam than Italy is, right? Just as an example, um, and uh, and Greece, uh, Athens is actually nor further north than Shanghai, okay? Um, and even little Singapore is 100 miles north of the equator. All of India is, if you look at, I'm trying to give you the northern hemisphere perspective. So if you look at it, India, China, uh, um, a little bit of Indonesia, not the populated parts, um, but all the largest economies in the world, most of the human population, are north of the equator, okay? And, uh, and the Arctic has been an area of geopolitical competition um, really for roughly 120 years. Um, you can go back further if you think about exploration and things like that, but um, the, it's, it's been important in a number of different ways. So I'll, I'll, I'll quickly go through and complement some of the uh, the comments so far. So there's two existential threats that emanate from the Arctic. One, Maricel talked about, which is global climate change because of the two big feedback loops that are there. The ice shield that melts, right now it's white, it reflects 80% of the sunlight out. Once it's that deep blue seawater, it absorbs 80%. That's a big problem. And then the permafrost, which probably, it's, there's a huge project underway um, called permafrost pathways, uh, which which Wilson Center is involved in, the Kennedy School is involved in, I'm sort of involved in, um, and uh, and others in Alaska are. Uh, but looking at this huge problem of melting permafrost, releasing methane, hugely accelerating climate change, out of our control. Okay, so anyway, not to not to get anyone depressed, but it's a big problem. Um, the other, what's the what's the other existential threat that emanates from the Arctic? There's no wrong answer, okay. Uh, well, that, yeah, maybe there's three, actually. Yeah, that's not a bad one if you've seen The Last Ship on TNT. It's very good. Yeah, go ahead. But many of the great powers have the Arctic. Yes, that's, yes. Territorial disputes in the region. Uh, not really. Uh, we can, uh, but, but good, good, good try. Don't worry. I appreciate it. It's, um, has anyone heard of nuclear war? <laughs> Where do most of the nuclear-capable submarines sit right now? Under the Arctic, why? So we don't can't find them. You can't find them because the ice breaks and makes noise, making it the best place to hide in the global ocean, except for maybe the Wendell Sea in the Antarctic. But how far is the Wendell Sea from the major capitals of the nuclear powers? Far, okay, you can just say it's much further than the Arctic. So the Arctic is literally the very, and so, um, now, if we look at, I'll, let's take a U.S. military perspective. Um, the Navy's biggest presence is under the ocean, okay, the subsurface fleet, the submarines. Um, the Air Force has huge investments in the Arctic because of what? NORAD. NORAD. Thank you very much. The, uh, so the, the North, let's see, what does NORAD stand for? Always The North American... Oh, basically the defense against nuclear, the early warning systems, okay, to detect when nuclear missiles are coming. It was, it was built up during the Cold War, so it was against the Soviet Union, but now it's against Russia and others. Okay, that's why the U.S. Air Force has a base in Greenland. Greenland. Thank you very much. Yeah, very good. Um, and, uh, and the Coast Guard is finally recapitalizing its fleet of polar security cutters to have a presence on the surface. And occasionally the U.S. Navy has a surface fleet, but it's just really in the high north. Okay, so with that, I'm just going to conclude with this statement, okay? Um, I, my students have heard this before. Um, so 2022 is the most interesting time to study global affairs. 
unfortunately. Okay, it's a curse in China to live in interesting times. We live in very interesting times. Okay, so it's a multi-nuclear geopolitical world, okay, with uh, increased competition among the great powers. Um, the climate crisis is a major crisis that requires cooperation. Uh, globalization, for the first time in, uh, since, first time since the Cold War, is really receding. Um, and uh, the domestic politics of most countries is quite toxic. This is a recipe for disaster. And the question is, how do we navigate that, to use a maritime term, uh, in the Arctic and other places? So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Weitz. Um, so first, we will start out with um, a couple of questions for most of the panelists. And then we will turn to the audience for a Q&A session, and then followed by a breakout room session, allowing the audience to talk to our panelists in a smaller group setting. Um, so this first question is from us, and I would like to direct it to all the panelists. Um, so what are your thoughts on the way forward for the US or China's role in the Arctic? And what does that look like in the near, or just in the future in general? Ladies first. Hey, Dr. Hong, would you like to? I assume you want me to talk about China's role in the Arctic, right? So, <laughs> so yeah, I think, well, as I mentioned earlier, China is a United state, but has a lot of interest, particularly developing or engaging international institutions. I think China compared the four areas that it has either interest or investment, shipping, natural resources, research, and also insti uh, international institution. I think. Um, research is one of the areas that try and actually have more role to play because uh, in terms of shipping, we have three shipping routes. Uh, Canada is a Northwest Passage, the weather does not allow it because when, every time when we talk to our Canadian scholars, they say we're not ready. Even, even in the summer when we have more ice melting, but our search and rescue is not ready. So don't count too much on transit through Northwest Passage. And the Trans-Arctic is also uh, very difficult. Um, in the past, I think people, particular country from Asian country, not only China, but also Japan and South Korea, they have a lot of accountability or high expectation of shipping through uh, Russia's Northern Sea Road. But now, because of the Ukraine conflict, uh, conflict, and then a lot of the country, particularly international shipping companies, they are not going to, I think currently the Northern Sea Route, uh, the foreign registry is zero, if I'm not, uh, if my memory is not mistaken. So shipping is the area, although China has a lot of interest, but it's not the major that you can actually play a much role. For investment on natural resources, because in the Arctic, there is a certain area called <coughs> um, areas beyond national jurisdiction that every country has their own interest, and you can actually uh, conduct or apply for conducting mining uh, activity through International Seabed Authority. But currently, because the five other states, Norway, Russia, and Canada, and Denmark, they actually already submitted to a standard kind of shock to the CLCS, but there's a long way to come to a conclusion where are the areas for national jurisdiction, where are the areas for beyond national jurisdiction, for, for example, if China wants to invest or engage uh, resource management in the Arctic, it has to do uh, through cooperating with the little state, which means that you have to be, for instance, a foreign investment in this kind of format. And on that, I think uh, China has done a lot in the European session of the Arctic, like uh, talking to, for instance, Denmark, but it's also encountered a lot of difficulty in Greenland because uh, American aggression being pushed back. Uh, <laughs> and then, although it's working hard in other countries like Finland and also out of Sweden and also Norway, but it's a, it's a long process. We don't see, we, we see a lot of discussion, but we don't see the concrete implementation or uh, results yet. So, uh, and then research, I think China's spent a lot of efforts. Uh, currently, there are already 12 expedition, research expedition in the Arctic. And then it also established many uh, research cooperation center with, for instance, with Iceland, with Finland, and certainly with Russia. And there was a joint research institute cooperating with uh, the European session. However, I think China's uh, cooperation with the US in terms of research is quite limited compared with its effort with the European states. And the so same with uh, China and then China and Canadian. 
in terms of research. So in the future, I think China it will continue. Uh, I'm not saying increasing influence. It will continue pursuing its interest in research and also other areas, but still cooperation. Thank you. Okay, um, great. So, so the U.S. actually, we just released uh, an updated national strategy for the Arctic region, which I would recommend checking out. It's not super long, or it's it's a good read. Um, I am biased, but it's it's still not not painful. Uh, and so, there are four pillars that were identified for U.S. strategic interests in the Arctic. First and foremost, security, securing the homeland. Uh, a big piece of that is NORAD modernization, so working with Canada to make sure that we are able to detect and track, uh, you know, things like hypersonic and ballistic missiles, which currently are something that the, the current NORAD system was not designed to be able to do. Um, so that's a big one. And, and this is also where, you know, throughout all of these, there is like that climate lens, right? Because um, thawing permafrost in the Arctic has the potential to uh, undermine some of our radar sites. So things like that, working with um, entities like Krell uh, in New Hampshire, which is the Cold Regions Research and Engineering Lab, a part of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, they are a great partner for looking at engineering solutions to be able to deal with uh, with this ground that you can no longer just, you know, reliably build into uh, because of it thawing. So we have um, security as the first pillar, and, and also that's very much about, you know, working with allies and partners, right? Um, the second is governance. So there's the, the Arctic Council is not a governance body, but it is the region's premier intergovernmental forum for cooperation. Um, because it pulls all the eight Arctic states and they're able to work on areas of mutual interest. And this is something that has had a, an immensely stabilizing effect on the region. It, it has helped to really centralize that regional decision making is made primarily by the eight Arctic states and not by a UN body. And there's been a real um, a desire among all eight, including you know the U.S. and Russia and others, for for this really to re remain the case, right? We don't want the U.N. to to kind of have a larger role because it will internationalize the space even more. And this gets into some of what uh, Dr. Hong was saying with around governance issues. Um, so, so that that's another. Um, and, and so the Arctic Council, the issue with that is that when Russia invaded Ukraine, they were chair. And it's a consensus-based body, but it has this two-year rotating chairmanship. And basically, the body was put on hold um, as a result of Russia's war because we weren't going to continue to work with them as if, you know, as business as usual during this, like, extremely violent, uh, you know, violation of U Ukraine's sovereignty. Um, so Russia is supposed to be handing the chairmanship over to Norway in May 2023, and the ability for that to happen is a big question. There's a lot of procedural, technical questions about what that looks like. Um, you know, if Russia wants to be a spoiler, if they, you know, they see it to be in their benefit to maintain this Arctic Eight construct. Um, or if they may look elsewhere, like to you know expanding things like BRICS, right, and um, kind of opportunistic partnerships. But there's a lot of risk associated with that because it's it is the you know the eight the eight construct was very much about uh, shared interest in in regional economic development, right? So Russia has an interest in in maintaining this, but it was also as we can see from how things have played out, it was not in Russia's interest to invade Ukraine, and they did that too. So the the way that decisions are made in Russia um, and kind of, you know, who makes decisions and why and whose interests are being gauged is, a, a, a you know, that's a big part of how decisions are made. Uh, the two other pillars of our new strategy are, are on climate and scientific research. Um, just again, because things are changing so quickly, the Arctic Ocean is acidifying four times faster than the global ocean. 
and we have fish that are migrating towards the poles because it's getting too hot around the equator, but then they're hitting up against this more acidic environment. So, and then, and then you know, there's only so far north you can go. So there's a lot of questions about about you know ocean health, right, and the ability to have commercial fisheries if we do not reel in the amount of warming that our world experiences because the ocean has been really absorbing a lot of the carbon dioxide um, and it's really that that's been buffering the effects for us on land but it's it's hitting up against this ability to continue to absorb carbon dioxide and that's where we're seeing that that's what the acidification is coming from. It's this chemical reaction from that influx of, of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, but it can't continue to be doing this. So we're going to be seeing more warming on, on land and in, in the atmosphere because of that. Um, and then the, the fourth uh, pillar is economic development. And, um, you know, just we really need infrastructure to support presence for, for the military and for communities of the Arctic. Uh, so, for instance, we have a, a deep water port that, that the NDAA a couple years ago called for a strategic port in the Arctic. The U.S. currently does not have... Um, we, we have a, a port along the Aleutian Island chain in Dutch Harbor that can um, take gray hulls, but basically you have to go... Uh, uh, the, the way that it currently works, like even with our icebreaker Healy, um, the ship will be off, you know, offshore, and then you have to take a little Zodiac, and that's highly weather dependent. So in 2019, I was up on Healy, or I was trying to get on Healy, and I was in Nome uh, in Alaska, on the west, uh, west coast of Alaska. And uh, we, uh, we kept getting delayed with being able to get onto the icebreaker because a, a late season storm came through and the waves were just too big. And so again, this is also, um, so you, you have to think about, you know, in terms of like the systems of, of facts that are happening, you have thawing permafrost, so you have to take that in consideration with infrastructure. But then we're also going to be having more late season storms. Like it's no longer going to be a late season storm. It's just storms, right? The Arctic used to be a graveyard for storms because they would hit up against this cold water and it would lose all its energy. Now what's happening is it's not, they're not only not dying, they're actually reinvigorating because it's warmer. And you have the loss of, uh, of land fast ice that was it basically would protect coastal communities but when you don't have the ice you have more direct shore impacts and so it's causing much more like higher levels of erosion um, and salt water intrusion and stuff like that so there's a lot of issues for communities um, in, in the arctic um, and then i just want to quickly note that we the u.s has also been building up structural equities to demonstrate the U.S. is a region of strategic significance to us that will persist beyond any one presidential administration. And so things like um, the new Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Arctic and Global Resilience, that's a new office that was created at the Pentagon. Um, we have the Ted Stevens Center, which is DOD's sixth regional center to open, and that's located in Alaska. Um, and, you know, re-standing up the U.S. Arctic Executive Steering Committee, which has the, the job of uh, basically co convening all federal entities that have some type of Arctic equity and being able, they are, they're leading the, um, the strategy development with the National Security Council, and uh, they will also be working together uh, to create the implementation plan, which will be coming out um, you know, sometime maybe early next year. So I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, here we go. I'll try to be fast. All right, so, um, okay, so um, how many were at the panel yesterday? Because I was not. Okay, all right, good. Um, it's the same thing, resource extraction. So the question is where, how the U.S. and uh, its allies and China and uh, its friends um, are competing. It's fundamentally about resource extraction. Um, and things are getting very complicated. So because of the permafrost melt, um, there was a huge oil spill in the Russian high north in Norilsk, where essentially, or yeah, it was, it was oil, like a pipeline broke, and then the oil spilled into the river. They've also had um, barriers that were holding mining waste. They melted, 
and it went into the river. Anyway, so not not good. Um, the uh, there's essentially three areas of resource extraction. Um, number one is fish and seafood. Okay, um, and there's a Central Arctic Ocean Treaty um, that includes China and the Arctic countries. Um, it is set to expire though in 20. Yeah, it's they have 20. I think it. I think it has a 16-year term. Um, but then I. But then it just dissipates. According to David Bolton, yeah, that was the best they could get. Um, and so, uh, so the good news is they've kind of pushed off that competition for now, um, because the the Central Arctic Ocean, as the the migratory fish move further north looking for colder water, uh, could become an important fishery. But of course, would be that would not be good, and it'd be nice to regulate it. So they're trying to. Well, we'll see how long that goes. The other is so oil and gas. Um, the the Arctic has a huge amount of natural gas, um, uh, which is obviously important. How many of you have heard of the European energy crisis? Okay, all right, yeah. So anyway, gas is still important. Okay, um, and then uh, how many of you have heard of rare earth metals and the energy transition? Have anybody heard of that? Uh, the largest nickel mine in the world is in Russia, Norilsk, in the Arctic. The largest zinc mine, the Red Dog Mine, in Alaska. Um, there's lots of rare earths up there, and rare earths are always. Sorry, students who have heard me say this. Rare earths are not rare; they're just rarely mined, and they're rarely processed. Um, and right now, China has a dominating position on processing of rare earths. Um, linking back to what I said earlier, kind of concluding my remarks about de uh, globalization receding. Um, unfortunately, and I kind of hate to see this as a Fletcher School professor, we believe in international cooperation. So, uh, um, and I, I, I think it can be done. Um, I'm, I'm still optimistic, actually. Um, but uh, the realities are it's receding. And I think there's going to be decoupling um, of the economies, and we're seeing kind of two, the Ukraine war has accentuated it. We're seeing maybe three economic blocks. Um, the North Atlantic block, which includes Canada, the U.S., and actually, I guess, anybody supporting the U.S. and the Ukraine effort, and NATO and the Ukraine effort, which includes Japan, and even Singapore, actually. Um, but then, there's the Russia and its friends, uh, block, um, which includes a lot of non-aligned countries, and then there's kind of a non-aligned block, which is actually the majority. Uh, most just want to stay out of it. Um, you don't necessarily hear that so much in the U.S. press, but there's there's uh, there's a lot of consensus against Russia um, in the United States and NATO countries, but outside of that, it's starting to dissipate. Um, but fundamentally, where the Arctic, because so so why has the Arctic not been developed? Because of the the inaccessibility. Um, and because climate change is making it more accessible, all of a sudden, commercial projects that weren't viable, say, 20 years ago, are viable now. Um, and, uh, and China has its Polar Silk Road Initiative, which is part of the wider Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and China has a real advantage because they run a trade surplus. So they pile up dollars. Um, the U.S. runs a huge deficit, so we don't have dollars, though we have a lot of private finance. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to see, my, my sense is we're going to see an emerging geoeconomic competition between China and the United States and NATO countries um, and some U.S. allies and partners that run a trade surplus, like Japan, in places like the Arctic for infrastructure development with the goal of resource extraction. Right now, China is really the leader in that, I would say. Um, and I, I've been to China many times. Um, I'm very envious of their infrastructure. How many of you have flown into or out of Boston Logan Airport? Okay. How many of you have ever been to an airport in China? Okay. Yeah. China's nicer. Okay. Um, and don't even get me started on Amtrak. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's, jeez, it's reliable for its unreliability. Um, and so, uh, but... That's, that's kind of where we are, and so it's very interesting. I will make one last uh, point, which is, uh, how many of you have a Netflix subscription? Okay, yeah, it's okay, you can say yes. I do too, all right. Um, there's, a, there's a great series called Borgen. Uh, it's in Danish, which is a little rough, um, but there's subtitles. Um, and so, uh, but it's all about geoeconomic competition from a Danish perspective with China and the US and the Nordic countries and NATO competing over resources in Greenland. 
It's actually great. It's, a, it's actually a great series. I highly recommend. Uh, so with that, I'll stop talking. Thank you so much. Thank you for the recommendation. I'll watch that. Good Saturday night. Thank you. <laughs> um, we will now open it to audience Q and A. If you could pass me that mic, please. So, if you have a question, you can come up, form a queue over here, um, right down here, and then we will pass along the mic. If anyone has a question, I can start off because I have personally have a question. I have many questions that I didn't get a chance to ask. So, very happy people are asked questions. Um, hey everybody, it's more fun when you ask questions. No dumb questions. True. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, you know, the Arctic is a finite resource, and as we spoke a lot, it's becoming more accessible and much more valuable now. And I was wondering how you see the future of conflict in the area. Specifically, do you think it's be more direct? Is there a possibility for proxy conflict? What does that kind of look like in the future? Uh, it's gonna gonna be more. It's gonna be uh, a warmer conflict. You know, so there's going to be more chance, I think, unfortunately. Um, and uh, it will be very interesting to see what happens with the Arctic Council. I'm cautiously optimistic that the Norwegians will find a way to get the Russians to pass the chair. And um, so Russia, Russia's half the Arctic. Okay. It's a little challenging to do Arctic cooperation if you ignore half the Arctic. And I'm definitely a minority opinion. I think, I think it's good that they were punished. But I'm for unsuspending the Arctic Council once the chair moves and keeping Russia in. Um, and my argument is this, and when you just think about it, when has diplomatically isolating a country and not talking to them ever achieved strategic objectives? You had the answer right. Never. Okay, so why would we do that? Um, emotion over analytics. That's why. And which is a real issue. Humans are emotional beings. Um, so, uh, so we, but we need to maybe be strategic. And the good news is we actually are quietly still cooperating with the Russians with the Coast Guard. Not officially, really. But uh, because of um, their shared interest over combating illegal fishing, about uh, being ready for search and rescue, or responding to, say, a distressed vessel to avoid marine pollution, so an oil spill, if a, so if a, say, a Russian fishing vessel loses power in the Bering Sea, which is a very rough area, and is heading toward land somewhere, and the U.S. Coast Guard is the nearest asset, are we going to help? I hope so, and I think so. So the good news is that. Um, but we'll see what happens. I mean, I, the, um, I've kind of gotten out of the prediction business um, because it's been so unpredictable this year. Um, but that gives me pause that I think there could be some kind of conflict there. Um, and I think it would most likely involve Russia and against a NATO country. Um, and it would probably be, well, we, we, it would probably be hybrid in nature. Um, so it would be really hard to, to pinpoint things. But you may have noticed, um, if you've been reading Arctic news, uh, some submarine cables have been cut in the Arctic. Hmm, I wonder who did that. All right, okay, it's just interesting questions. But like, there's, so there's conflict happening, I would argue. It's just been a little under the radar. Yeah. Um, so... I, it's still, it's not like in anybody's interest for there to be conflict in the Arctic. Uh, it's not in Russia's interest, right? First of all, they're so overextended in Ukraine. They've already had to like, you know, withdraw from Kyrgyzstan, but they are hugely hev heavily militarily engaged there. They're not looking to start conflict in another theater, right? Like, so, so that is something definitely, you know, to keep in mind, like, why would Russia do that? They're, um, so they're, they're, they have this whole bastion defense concept based around the Kola Peninsula, which is the hub for their strategic submarines. And so they have, um, you know, so it's, 
So basically, you know, this is an area that is really important for them to defend, right? So they're, this is where their threat perception certainly um, could be affected because they have this, you know, the, the heart of the bastion defense concept around the Kola Peninsula, then there's the near sea zone and then the far sea zone. And when you look at how close they are to Scandinavia, uh, you know, Finland and Sweden joining NATO, this is certainly going to to increase the threat perception that Russia ex feels, right? Especially, you know, we're anticipating something like a, you know, like an, um, a joint air command uh, just because of the concentration of air power that's going to be in Scandinavia will be even more than what we have in Alaska right now with all of the, the F-35s um, and then the, the Gripen from Saab um, in Sweden, which has, uh, you know, is, is going to be very complimentary for NATO because it has a very strong anti-electronic warfare platform, which the F-35s do not, are not as strong with. Um, so this is, you know, the, the, basically the northern bastion of NATO, it will never have been stronger. Um, but again, Russia, because as Rocky was saying, uh, Russia is over half of the Arctic, they, under international law, they have extensive claims. And so they they see it as a matter of their own national economic security to be able to realize the economic potential of their Arctic, the different resources that they have, the minerals, the fossil fuels, the ability to commercialize the northern sea route. And so to in order to attract business investment, when you already have certain things that make investors weary, adding conflict to that would not help, right? It, right. it really factors into the risk analysis from, from the private sector. So I would say that it's not likely that conflict would start in the Arctic. There is, there is concern about potential ways that it could spill over or, um, you know, Russia's really known for um, just really unsafe uh, air incursions, you know, coming really close to certain, uh, you know, our air assets or even to critical infrastructure. And basically, they don't have the benefit of the doubt that they had before. So th there is, you know, more potential now than there was before of, uh, you know, just misreading the situation. Yeah. So things like that, there are certainly, there's more risk. Sorry, keep stick on. I think uh, very quickly, two fingers. I think I was very inspired by both your remarks because it gave me more hope when thinking about the future of Arctic cooperation. I, I can share with you why I keep so worrying. Uh, last week, I attended two events related to Arctic, and people, there's some scholar in yeah, Chatham House, I'm not going to say which, for which country, they're talking about the future of Arctic Council. They're talking about the second version of Arctic Council, which means that they're going to create a new RT7+. Plus. And you don't know who will be the plus. Uh, you may be one of the Asian countries, but definitely Russia is not a plus. So, And then there's another term they're talking about democratic Arctic. A non-democratic Arctic. That is a very dangerous to feature and uh, and yeah to feature the future of Arctic Council. And I think that's more dangerous. I read a, a most recent report published by Ron Corporation, a Swedish uh, defense agency. They are talking about the uncertainty uh, in the Arctic affairs. I think I think one of the most issue that actually worry me a lot because many of the international uh, funding agencies, they cut the funds to like, keep Russia out of the picture, out of any other scientific cooperation project. And that's going to affect the climate change issues in the Arctic because Russian scientists, they have been involved in many of the international cooperation in this area. And then the, the, the funding companies not only from the US, from all over the world, and then actually they worry me a lot about the future of the Arctic cooperation. And the other factor I want to mention is like in July, Russia uh, issued its uh, new maritime doctrine. It emphasized so much about the Arctic. I think when I count it, they mentioned 66 tons of Arctic compared with these two previous uh, maritime doctrine back in 2004 and yeah, in 2013. Yeah, and talk about the U.S. threats and the threat from the NATO, and it's talking about like even increasing its budget on Navy and vessels and Coast Guard and icebreaker. Russia has a lot already compared with U.S. compared with other countries. 
has a lot of capacity already, but it's still talking about increasing its budget on that. And it's also talking about using many of its non-military vessels in military conflict. That's a signal. So that actually worries me a lot. But after hearing the two of you, and I, I feel like the whole Friday Council, RT Corporation is coming back. Yeah, 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 we'll see. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Um, if you want to come down, ask your question. Uh, thank you for the talk today. I'm Mishitman Marinkovich from the United States Naval Academy. Uh, as we talked about with China, um, as far as the U.S. strategy with uh, developing nations, we can't necessarily match pound for pound the amount that China invests. So I'm wondering about a similar approach to the Arctic, of course, Murmansk and Arkhangelsk, um, as well as the fact that Sweden and Finland joining NATO would make the Baltic a NATO sea. Uh, Russia has a lot more of a stake in the Arctic compared to uh, we don't have as much infrastructure development on the North American landmass. Uh, the U.S. and Ken don't have population centers uh, as much past the Arctic Circle. Do you think that it would be fair for the U.S. to try to do a catch-up approach with regards to building that infrastructure, increasing our icebreaker fleet, or do you think we have to come up with an alternative strategy, much like we're doing to combat China's competition? Thank you. So thank you for the question. Good question. Um, actually, I'm in the process of writing an article about this, um, especially, especially with icebreakers. So um, you may know that NATO has uh, something called the strategic airlift capability for small states. They, they basically bought a bunch of C-17s, which were the airplanes that evacuated out of Kabul. So they're kind of now popularly known outside of military circles. I know you all, you military already knew about it, but um, the, uh, and so they share them. These small countries essentially have a timeshare. Um, and it's based in Hungary. And what I've, what I'm arguing, and I mentioned it in a shorter article on, and a publication called The Conversation, actually about a year ago, behind schedule, um, but uh, is a icebreaker capability that NATO could do for small countries. And I argue you could even expand it beyond NATO to include Singapore, for example. Um, and and the probably the most likely contributors to that would be Finland, which has a huge icebreaking fleet because of the Baltic. So the Baltic is actually the least saline of any sea. Uh, and so it freezes um, faster than any other part of the ocean, in the northern hemisphere at least. Um, and, so, and so Finland has this capability um, and the Nordics have kind of an incentive to have the capability for Arctic exploration because they're locally there. But you could see um, like a, it would be a force multiplier for the U.S. So the U.S., we ha we're building out six polar security cutters, three heavy icebreakers, three medium. Um, and that's actually kind of amazing. It is actually going uh, to plan. Uh, the Navy could maybe learn about from the Coast Guard on uh, being on time and under budget on, uh, don't get me started on the Ford, okay? Yeah, but, um, but basically I think that um, I'm a big believer in the U.S. So this, this is uncomfortable for a lot of people in the Pentagon. And I sometimes, um, they, I make them uncomfortable, uh, but I think in a good way, um, which is um, we can't, so at the end of World War II, the U.S. had a 6,000 ship Navy. 6,000 ship Navy, okay. At the end of the 80s, we almost got to 600 ships. We had 596. How many do we have today? Anybody help me out? Uh, less than, it's less than, it's 270 something, okay. Um, we need a bigger Navy, okay. The best thing that the U.S. has that has built since 1945 is a number of very capable allies and partners. And NATO, I do think, I think, um, so I think the Ukraine war was maybe the greatest miscalculation that Putin's ever made um, because it has strengthened NATO in major ways. And assuming Turkey lets them in, it's, it will happen. It's just how much they'll extract. Um, but uh, as far as concessions from Sweden and Finland, but assuming that Finland, Swinland, F Finland and Sweden both come into NATO, um, we're going to have, um, I agree with Marisol that the, the capability in the high north of NATO is going to be uh, stronger than it's ever been. Um, that could have an uh, unintended consequence of getting Russia to essentially viewed as a security dilemma and militarize even more in the high north where it already has. Um, but I think that there's a real opportunity for the U.S., which on the subsurface is very strong. The submarine fleet is probably the strongest part of the U.S. Navy. Um, and uh, sorry, 
Sorry, Swoes. Um, but yeah, um, for now, maybe. Um, and uh, But the, the U.S. Navy is sending carriers to the high north when um, conditions allow, but doesn't have any ice-breaking capability. Um, but that may be okay. I mean, I think that in the high north of the Atlantic, and the big question is, where does the Atlantic end and where does the, where does the Arctic start? This is like an existential maritime question. Um, and, but ba basically, the high north here, in the high north of the Atlantic, um, is a, is, remains an area of naval competition. Um, and the Greenland, Iceland, UK gap for anti-submarine warfare and surveillance is very important. Um, and we will see, this then kind of bleeds in just to bring it back to China. Um, there's US discomfort with a scientific research station in Iceland, in the north of Iceland, that China has underwritten in collaboration with the Icelandic government because of the dual use possibility of that research station there for climate research, ostensibly or officially, um, but that, uh, that it, can, it has a dual use, right? And the same happens in Svalbard, um, in, which is the very northern part of Iceland, or Nor uh, Norway, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so my name is Manuel. I'm a freshman student. Tough. So my question is about the tactical and military role that Alaska could play uh, in, a, in an Arctic that's going to be more active in the, in the geopolitics scene, right? So what, what could the role of Alaska could be in that case? Maybe will there be more military bases there? Will there be more infrastructure there financed by the military? What's going to be the scenario that you think is going to happen? Uh, I think yes and yes and yes. The other thing is very interesting will be uh, what happens with the Aleutian Islands and if they're reconstituted. The other thing that Alaska is really looking at, um, and I think Lisa Murkowski is going to win the election, um, but she's been a real leader in getting um, through the, um, through the, I think through the Inflation Reduction Act, um, uh, hydrogen research for so Alaska has some of the best wind in the American exclusive economic zone. Um, and you could see here in the Aleutians, essentially offshore wind converted to green hydrogen, and Alaska could become a green hydrogen, literally superpower for the United States, um, which would be really good for the energy transition. That's like another paper that I'm also behind on anyway for, yeah, be just unproductive. Uh, but basically, I think there's a lot of commercial opportunity, and I think the military will be there. I do want to just um, add one thing that Marisol said a while ago. So the, the, U, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea is what is the international law that governs the Arctic Ocean. Um, and it's the most comprehensive international treaty, some, some people call it the Constitution of the Sea. Um, and it's, um, I actually think it's a great example of trying to regulate the commons with international law. Uh, we have a Law of the Sea course, I don't teach it, but one of my colleagues teaches it here. Um, and it's a great example, and then the question becomes, can you use the regulation, the international regulation of the UN Convention Law of the Sea for the ocean space to try to regulate the space space and the cyberspace. That's a very interesting, in case you all are looking for things to research in your studies, there is, this is ready for creative, fresh thinking. Um, and I always tell this to my students and I'm gonna tell it to all of you in the audience. Um, you should put yourself out there if you have creative ideas. Don't assume that everyone knows how kind of like these places should be regulated. The same applies to actually hybrid warfare. Um, I've heard from good friend of mine at the Naval War College is like, nobody knows what to do with hybrid warfare in the maritime space. So like, I'm just trying to give you guys a little like confidence as you do your senior theses or whatever you're working on to, to, to pick one of these topics because they're definitely relevant. Um, so. Uh, so I just want to add one quick thing to the previous question, um, which was basically that um, the new national defense strategy that came out had a, a little Arctic section, and in it, it talks about how the U.S. approach to the Arctic, which we do view as a, a region of immense strategic significance, it's going to be calibrated, right, because the Indo-Pacific is our primary 
you know, area of interest right now. And that's also why we have all the F-35s at Isleson Air Force Base. It's not just, it's not for the Arctic, right? It's because you can get fighters over to the Indo-Pacific, you know, to certain parts of Asia faster from Alaska than you can from Hawaii. Yep. Right. And and from other certain areas. So that's really why we have this major concentration of fighter power, um, uh, power <laughs> there. Um, and then in terms of Alaska, um, you know, so that's also with the air power piece, um, obviously the early warning. Right. Being able to detect threats to the homeland, um, you know, with the, the creation of Space Force. Uh, we now have like clear Air Force Base became clear Space Force Base. Um, so we have increased, you know, assets to be able to support, you know, our, our interests in that domain. Uh, that's also where a, an installation like KSAT, which is on Svalbard in Norway, that is the highest um, ground ground station that has. So there's like satellites that will go in a polar orbit. And so there are there are 14 polar orbits, and KSAT is the only one that has all 14 um, covered. So again, like talking about that, uh, you know, just that that um, strategic significance of the region. And then uh, Isleson Air Force Base is also demoing a small modular reactor right now for so looking at. Uh, you know, using nuclear in a very distributed way because we've seen that these major nuclear energy facilities are just massive time energy and uh, energy stocks that always go over budget, right? And so this is a really interesting way of having distributed power. Um, so they're demoing this, and that's really a space to watch because if we think that this is, this is something feasible, it could be really a game changer for bringing energy to remote locations um, throughout the Arctic. Yeah. Awesome. I think we have time for one quick question. Oh, is that going to be it? Yeah. We can do a lightning round, I think. Yeah, you do two. Do two quick lightning round. Okay. Hi, I'm Mariana. You probably know me from all my emails I sent you. But um, <laughs> some of us went to Chile for research uh, over the summer, and uh, we went to the Chilean Ar Antarctic Institute in Punta Arenas. Um, and so we did some interviews there, but a lot of people higher up in the Chilean Navy were uh, expressing concern about the expiration of the 2048 Antarctic Treaty. So I was wondering, is this an actual concern uh, that countries will choose to not continue this treaty? And what are the implications of that? Uh, I'm Jacob Tots, Jr. at Tufts. I'm enjoyed hearing from y'all today. My, circling back to what you said about how the warming in the Arctic has made projects more viable to extract natural gas, my question is, how do you think the U.S. will approach this? Because on one hand, some climate scientists see don't see natural gas as a transition fuel in the energy transition, and some do. I was curious to get your take on that. Very quick on the future of 2040, 2048 Antarctic Treaty. I think, yeah, there's a time, but I think that the Antarctic Treaty system is very mature, system governing the Antarctica. And then all these countries who either has territory claim or who are very far and does not have territory, they're all bound by the Antarctic Treaty. Uh, so in, in the future, I think. I do not see it as a problem, and definitely it will be a long process to get everyone on board and reach consensus on many of the issues. Like for instance, on the marine protected area, I think lately there were discussion uh, on why China and Russia does not uh, support uh, your uh, vacation for maritime protected area. It's interesting, it happens all the time that people put China and Russia on the same basket, they have different interests and they have different reasons to, not again, but I think it takes time to understand and also tell the community why it actually does not support. It's not against, it does not support. Yeah. And China support the U.S. and, and maritime protected area, Ross and U.S. New Zealand 
or your priority area takes time. But you also, it's a process, because when you're talking about a government and tiger, you're talking about science, and you talk about environment, talk about climate, so, and fishing, a lot of issues. So countries who are concerned, for instance, in expanding maritime protected area in Antarctica, they have a concern. For instance, some countries, they say, you have to make a balance on conservative and also uh, economic activities in terms of fishing. A lot of countries, they have to depend on fishing. Regulated, not I use your fishing, regulated and formalized fishing. And then they have a concern, they need to find a way to balance a conservative, like to conserve the environment, like such as the long term to protect area. On the other hand, you have to make a balance to conduct certain type of com uh, commercial activity. I think that's why I think the uh, Antarctica, the fishing agreement and the Central Ocean, uh, Antarctic Ocean, I think. Uh, you as all the other five plus China, plus Japan, South Korea, and European Union. They all sign and ratify. I think that's a way for the next 16 years, you're not going to conduct any unregulated fishing. That's a way and also give you some time to let, to gain experience. What, what, there, yeah, scientists, yeah, you need technology to make sure that those fishing activity is uh, to maximize your economic interest, but also not to harm the environment. So. That's uh, the question to answer to your Antarctica treaty consent. So um, on the question of uh, natural gas in Alaska, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because there, so Alaska had opened up, um, had basically tried to auction off different blocks of oil and gas to companies. And when they held the auction, Nobody showed up. Like, so this is the thing, is that it's one thing to have the resources, but like when you talk about the lack of infrastructure in the Arctic, and like especially the North American Arctic, like Alaska, Canada, you really don't understand unless you go there that you're like, oh, like there's no road. Like how do you, like it's one thing to have a mine or a, you know, a drilling rig, but then the, all the transport infrastructure, processing, all of that, is extremely expensive because you know how do you get equipment up there you have to barge it in uh, or you know fly it in um, so actually one one interesting like kind of tool a tech, technological tool that's being looked at for being able to help with certain types of infrastructure projects in the Arctic and get around the lack of road issue is airships which are basically like these big kind of dirigible things that can carry a lot of, of cargo um, by air. And so that could take away the need for roads because roads, it, 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 you know, it, it's very expensive. There's a lot of issues with, you know, disturbing habitat, um, just the maintenance, like it's just extremely expensive. And so that that side of, of any type of, um, you know, project is a, is a very significant consideration. And we've seen that as also something that's really been a hindrance to Greenland being able to develop more of their rare earth minerals. Um, again, it's just about, you know, we really would need a capital influx to develop the infrastructure to be able to get the, the minerals to port, right? And, and so, so it's really just because it's so expensive um, in, in Alaska, especially in the North Slope, um, you're also dealing with lots of permafrost thaw again, so a lot of disruption to infrastructure, higher risk potential for a spill in an area that's really, um, you know, really important for, for food security, very difficult to clean up. Like, it's hard enough to clean up uh, an oil spill like Deepwater Horizon that happened in, like, the lower latitudes. Then you add ice cover or just really severe conditions. It is very, very, very difficult. And basically, like, we can't do it. Like, we wouldn't be able to recover the oil. There's still even the Exxon Valdez, if you dig like an inch down in the sand, you hit oil on the beaches because it's just, they couldn't clean it up. So these are all considerations. Do you want to? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so great questions. Um, so the Antarctic Treaty was the first non-proliferation, nuclear non-proliferation treaty in the world. Um, Eisenhower did it uh, trying to get the um, Soviets engaged to do arms control. And the idea was uh, you can't test nuclear weapons in Antarctica. 
Okay, there's a shared interest in that, and then they decided to set it aside for for scientific, uh, for science, right, uh, and not for resource extraction. But that that treaty will expire, and we'll just have to see um, how the politics allow for. There's a definitely shared interest in not testing nuclear weapons in Antarctica even today, right? So and there's a shared interest in not extracting from there uh, for the same things. So I would say, so the oil and gas question is an interesting one. Um, I, it's really hard to know um, what future administrations will, how they will view gas. Um, I think I totally agree with Monticello's point about, so the Deepwater Horizon, that oil spill happened in basically, if you could pick the best place to respond in U.S. waters, that's where it happened. And it still went for almost 90 days, or was it 91 days before it was contained? Um, and there's huge assets there. There's, there's private sector assets. There's Coast Guard assets. Um, and it really is hard to understand, unless you've been to Alaska, how little infrastructure is there, uh, and just how few people are there. So um, uh, for those of you who are tough students, um, there's more people in Medford, Massachusetts than who live in Alaska north of the Arctic Circle, so on the North Slope. Uh, there's also more, it's about the same in Greenland. The whole Greenland is Medford, Massachusetts, which is about 60,000 people, okay? And in the Arctic, there's about 4.2 million people it's smaller than the population of Massachusetts. There's just not a lot of people up there. Um, and that's why to get to remote Alaskan, the same, same happens in, 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 North, in, in Canada uh, and Greenland, it, the primary mode of transportation is by air. Um, and if you have to fly in fuel, like diesel, it's very, very expensive. I'm gonna end with a pitch. How many of you are tough students? Okay, um, so, uh, and how many of you could get on an airplane and come back here in February? You should all raise your hand. Okay. Anyway, so uh, so February 17th, Friday, and February 18th, Saturday, we're having our 12th annual Arctic Conference at Fletcher. Um, it will be just above here in ASEAN Auditorium. It's uh, free, and everyone is welcome. Um, it's uh, it's We are have actually the longest-running Arctic Conference of an APSEA school, an international affairs school, in the U.S. Um, and uh, it's usually fun. Um, uh, Marisol's boss has been here, Becca Pincus, as a, as a speaker. Um, David Bolton, who's now the chairman of the uh, U.S. Arctic Executive Committee, has also been a speaker. Um, we've had speakers from China, from Japan, uh, controversially from Taiwan, too. So anyway, we try to spice it up, um, and it should be a very good time. Um, and so you're all welcome to come. In fact, we should maybe have you speak. But uh, um, so that's Friday the 17th, Saturday the 18th. There'll be food. There'll be, it's free. Um, and we'll try to schedule it so it's, it doesn't start before 10. All right, so you can make it. All right, all right. So, uh, but no, thank you for this. Thank you to the organizers. And uh, it's great to have you all here. And then we do breakouts next. Is yes, that right? Yes, we do. Um, thank you so much for speaking. Oh, one quick thing. Yeah, of course, please. So we, we do have internships at Polar Institute, so if anybody's interested, you can check on our website and feel free to, if you have questions, like ask me about it. But um, yes, we'd love to, you know, if you're interested, okay. yes. Okay. <laughs> so much for the information and opportunity. I'm sure a lot of us will reach out to you all. Um, so well, thank you again um, for speaking and coming and answering and get, giving us such great insight. Um, first, we would like to thank you with, we have, couple of gifts for you all, um, and if possible, <laughs> you all can um, take a photo in front of this, yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah, I just don't know how. And then we'll announce break over Yes. 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 I'm going to take pictures, and then there will also be a lunch afterwards. I think in front of the poster would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Sorry about this. Thank you so much. Thank you.